Bill Pito, John Wallace, Monica McNutt, Knicks coach David Fisdale is back with us. Can you come on every night? <laughs> <laughs> I got stuff to do, man. What you talking about? <laughs> I got to ask you. So, obviously, we watch you do your thing. And after games, it's not like it's a handshake with the opposing coach. I mean, these guys, the, the, I don't know what the hugs. To me, they symbolize, like, these other guys that you go up against love you. You're so popular in the league. So I want to ask you, and you're so popular with your players. Does that make it harder to coach these guys? No, not at all. And it don't make it any harder to compete against them. In fact, that's the fun of it. You know, um, I love, you know, going at these guys and trying to beat the best. Uh, and there's just a, a real mutual respect there, I think. You know, I always try to pay homage to the coaching uh, fraternity. And I always try to be a guy that if a guy gets fired or gets hired, you know, I always try to reach out to everybody and be in connection with them because it's a volatile business. And, and when it comes to my guys, <clears throat> I think the closer I can get to the players, the yeah. better I can coach them. Now, what about the players, Coach? Because they all love you, too. Does it make it harder to discipline them? And no. That's when you can tell them the truth. I think the love comes from the truth. You know, John can attest to this stuff. You, are, you probably like your favorite coaches are the ones that were the most honest with you. Absolutely. Right. Sure. So, right, would For you sure. agree? So. Um, I think that, you know, I try to be absolutely 100% honest with them when I'm talking to them. Um, you know, obviously I don't try to tear them apart uh, and, and crush confidence, but I think just always delivering the truth and showing them how we can always fix something, uh, I think that's, you know, created relationships around the league that um, are hopefully lasting. And doing that, Coach, and sort of mm -hmm. navigating those relationships, how much of it is a give and take, right? Like, you got a roster of 13, 12 guys. There's a lot to measure. Maybe Mitch needs a different type of coaching than Zoe. Like, yeah. how do you sort of make sure each guy is getting what they need? You know, it's uh, – I just kind of do it right out the gate from as soon as the day starts, um, you know. And you probably had coaches like this that when I walk into the gym, I make sure I make contact with every single guy. You know, because mm -hmm. uh, every, everybody's going through something different. Some guys are struggling with their shots. Some guys are, um, you know, not playing at all. Some guys, it's just different yeah. things going on with guys. And, and personal things, you know, these guys are human. They're young. They're going through a lot off the court. And so I make it a point that before we even get the day jump started that I reach out and talk and put my hands on each guy just so they know. Uh, it's not just basketball f for me, you know, I'm gonna go through the struggle with you How can I help you through it and uh, you know for whatever reason it just by starting the day off that way It carries on throughout the day and I feel like you know Hopefully I'm giving these guy enough, but there are times where a guy has to call a meeting with me Coach I need to uh, talk to me. What am I doing? What's going on? How can I do this better and? You know Hopefully my players feel like they can all do that when I'm not necessarily sharing or giving enough of myself to them. So we're not happy with Wallace so far. Uh, I don't know if you want to take him aside. <laughs> Already? He just didn't come. He missed your morning didn't, text. Coach, he didn't come to the show in shape. <laughs> <laughs> Tough crowd. I mean, yeah, can you know? maybe talk him through here? Oh, uh, no. You, this guy's prepared. Kidding, this is like a beast right well, here. Are you kidding me? Well, Coach, first of all, you're, you're to be commended for the job you did with Emmanuel Moutier. Because um, I know being a former player, when you have a foot out the door, which he did, and you have one foot in the league because of your mm -hmm. contract, one foot out the door because you're not playing as well or you're in what you were expected to play, and you came in, turned him around, turned his diet around, he's, he's playing at a very high level. How do you feel about where he's going to go from here now? Like, that's the next step, right? Like, now he's going to make that step to, for consistency. Yeah, and that's, I think, you know, that's the hard part too mm -hmm. when you when you sign guys for a year or you got them for a year and they're in rebuild mode and you're rebuilding confidence and you know really structuring their game so that they can take that next step uh, is that I think now we've put all of those guys in a position that we got to fight to keep them mm -hmm. and that's a good problem to have that means that these guys really got better and you know the it wasn't about me it was much more about him and his investment and his openness uh to learning and working and, and really challenging himself to get in the best shape of his life um, unfortunately obviously late he got some injuries but i think the body of work of his season that he put in oh, yeah. uh, was fantastic I mean, it, it speaks for itself. The numbers, yeah. you can see the uptick. Now, Coach, I know you take a lot of pride in your role and in being one of the first African-American men to hold so many titles within an organization. Mm -hmm. 
uh, uh, not quite on your same level, but just follow me here, right? <laughs> there's, like, for me, there's black woman put before everything. How do you sort of acknowledge, yeah. celebrate, but also do your job and focus on the job? Like, how do you balance that? Well, see, that was a, you know, when thinking about, okay, what job am I going to take? Where am I going to be next? The Knicks had checked a lot of boxes. And really, before I, it even got to the point of talking about making history with those guys, they had already checked every box that I wanted in a, in a team and what I wanted to be a part of moving forward. And so when I found out when I was going to make the decision that that was actually the case, that this is the first time this has ever happened, um, I had to take a minute, yeah. you know, and, and take a moment to like really process that and like really think about what people went through before me, before Steve, before Scott so that we can be sitting here in this position. And so now that for me just puts a little bit extra on it that I want to do well to keep that pathway open for just whoever uh, to have the opportunity uh, to make the, the first happen. Right. Um, you know, because that's what it's about is, is really being inclusive and, and everyone having a real opportunity to reach the highest parts of the game. And um, you know, I'm just really proud to be a part of that with the, the two men that I'm a part of it with. Absolutely. You yeah. guys have all done a fantastic job. Bill Pito, Alan Hahn, and John Wallace. And for the first time, we say hello to Cam Smith. Cam, Good. what's up, man? Nothing much, Bill. How you doing? It's great to have you with us. So you're the point guard with us, right? Well, I, I've... A little erratic at times, but, but I'm going to try to get some plays for you for sure. Well, we got the two, we got the two scores right here. Then. As long as you give me the ball, you're good. No, I'm not going to get the ball at all. But I learned if you don't give Alan the ball, you got big problems. I'll just set screens when I'm with these guys. <laughs> Handles a little erratic, but we're going to have a great show here. All right, and of course, the big story here is the Knicks and the draft lottery next Tuesday night. Right here, we have our unscientific lottery machine. All right, guys, we've got colored balls. we got blue is one, yellow two, green is pick three, red right. is pick four, and white is pick five. If you there pick it is. five, I'm coming across the table. All right, well, <laughs> so you won't play. Did you freeze any of the ball? <laughs> right, right, exactly, right, right. All right, you guys nervous? We've got a week to advance Let's up. Let's get there. all the all bad right. luck out now. All right, here we go. Here's our first spin right here. All right. And, you, of course, wow. you know what it is? What are you doing? I told you I'm coming across the table. You got to let it. Right. There, it there we go. Oh, look at you know that. What? Look at we that. We don't want white. Get out. <laughs> Throw white, it out. Get out, out of here. Get out of here. Right. <laughs> we don't want white because that's pick five. Uh, the Knicks, no. of course, can get one, two, three, four, or five. Right. They have about a 48% chance of getting five. What happens if they get five? Uh, uh, first thing I'm doing is calling David Griffin, the new GM in New Orleans. Absolutely. And I'm seeing, all right, where do we begin the bidding? How do we yeah. get this thing started? Because you've got enough young players on this roster, you've got to start seeing what you can get for that five pick. And the first guy you have to talk about is Anthony Davis, in my opinion. And right now it's hard to say that there's uh, other players besides John Morant, Zion, and R.J. Baird that can change your, your franchise around. So it'd be outside of the top three, if you have the fifth pick, you got to definitely do it and try to uh, find someone, a trade partner. Yeah, but is somebody going to take that pick? Because if it's really only a two-player draft, who's going to want fifth overall? Well, oh, 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 oh. They're, they're gems some, sometimes, and, you know, in those later rounds, not later rounds, but at the same time, after picks three, four, Absolutely. maybe even five. So you never know what you're going to get. So and you, you also wanna... know how it works in the NBA. I mean, I always call the lottery the, or draft picks of the currency of hope, right? right. You have hope. And, and you don't know what the pick's going to be, but you sell that as the hope of something it could become. And if you're a franchise that's trying to move a big contract or a player who's not happy where he is, that's the biggest piece of hope you could sell when you make a trade like that. Hey, we're getting rid of this all-time player or a, a all-star player, but hey, everybody, we've got this hope right here. Look, look at all this. We have this draft pick. Yeah. So that you, to me, the higher the pick, the more valuable it, ha it is. Absolutely. So this is why a five pick, even in a draft that's not considered deep, is still valuable. Now, one thing to think about as we watch these NBA playoffs, you've got Kawhi Leonard dominating. Remember, he was 15th overall. Nikola Jokic dominating. Second round draft pick. So the question is, Alan, if you don't get the number one pick, when you go over the history of all this, it may not be the end of the world. Yeah, that, that's the amazing thing. Like, like, as we've been setting up for this year, I spent some time and just took a look at when this whole lottery began, right? Like, like to me, the 1990s where we begin, because we know, again, 85 was a frozen envelope, but they did that a little <laughs> more primitive, sort of like what we're doing here, right. reaching into the hopper. When they really went to the actual weighted lottery situation, which was 1990, you start to look at the players. That's 28 years of drafts that mm -hmm. we have. And what I came up with was that you have about five players or so 
that became superstars. And when you consider the fact that you were taking number one, you want to have a superstar yeah, player. Let's get to, we have a sponsored element, which is a good thing. All right. All right. Uh, by the number presented by New York Lottery, and this is what you're talking about, Alan. Yeah, and we take a look here. These are the best of the best. Now, this is 28 years I'm talking about. Of number one overall, not first round picks, not lottery picks, the very first pick of the draft. Those guys are Hall of Famers, and eventually, obviously, LeBron, Anthony Davis as well. We can argue that he is yep. already a great player. Yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, after that, you've got, out of these, out of these picks, you've got the Chris Webbers, the Glenn Robinsons. You've got other players that you'd say were all-star talents. But number one overall, like, you want to change your franchise. The way I put it together was the player that, when you drafted them, the next five years, you went, you did something significant as a franchise, right? Like Dwight Howard, you could say right now, stop you could it, look back stop at his it for career. One second. Al has just talked for four consecutive minutes. <laughs> yes. He has set an MSG Network record for, right. for longest statement. Right. I know we're on I for 150 minutes. Personal record. We set it on the first let, day. Let's I get, will break it. This is Cam's first day here. Let's, let's get him. Well, let's let get, me, him, how about let's I, get him the ball here how a little bit. You let me we see who the ball hog is. Is Allen on this thing, right? <laughs> This, of course, is a huge summer for the New York Knicks, for their president, Steve Mills, their GM, Scott Perry, and they recently sat down with our Alan Hahn to talk about all the big things that are ahead. How much time have you spent on this draft, and do you look at it as a deep draft? What type of draft do you see it, and what are your scouts telling you? No, well, our draft prep is every day, and, uh, you know, we, our scouts do a terrific job getting out, seeing a ton of games, uh, they also uh, uh, are learning a lot about the process. Our intel collection is, is uh, very uh, intense and comprehensive and because we want to learn about these young men, who they are as people. You know, we'll be able to, to find out about their games through you know, watching them in person and on, in the, and on tape. For us, for Steve and I as a front office, you know, prior, I'd say 85% of our home games, we're watching some sort of tape on draft prospects. So we start doing that in the very beginning of the year in late October, and uh, we continue to, you know, we did that throughout the regular season, and we'll continue to do so up until the draft. So we feel like we, we've got a good pulse on uh, the, the quality of players that are going to be in this draft, and, and we, we feel pretty, you know, comfortable with wherever we're going to pick, we're going to find somebody who can help this basketball team next and year. Our, and our group does, you know, Scott managing our, our, our scouting staff, they do a good job of making sure as we identify the players that are in our window of where we could potentially draft to make sure that, that Scott and I have seen a lot of tape on them, but also that we make sure that we've seen them at least once or twice live so we can get a feel for who they are in person and, and then get a feel on the intel from them. So they do a good job of prepping us so that, that we, we've seen and we know a lot about the people we need to know about. And when you consider the fact that you'll pick one through five, I mean, that's, uh, we know that's where you'll be in that range. Do you have the mindset of best player available or if we already have a player on the team at this play, you know, the same position type of thing, like, do you worry about that or do you just say, no, you take the most talented player and you go from there? I think where we're at right now, I mean, talent is important. You know, and so if it's, if it's very close, then obviously you may lean toward a position of need. But now if there's, if there's a clear delineation between the talent and, say, the talent of a guy of the position you need, I think you always err on the side of talent. Continuing with Jules Vianney, Monica McNutt, and Cam Smith. I could listen to Scott Perry talk all day. He's got a great, yeah. Yeah. He's got a great voice. <laughs> and to me, what's going to be interesting, obviously, the draft pick, we all want a high draft pick. There's a hope, obviously, that they get some major talent here, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving. But what's going to be really interesting is that that doesn't work, Cam, and Scott Perry is going to have to go into his bag of tricks here. If maybe they get the third pick, right. if they maybe have to get another free agent, that's not an A-tier free agent. Well, I love that Scott Perry says that they're doing their homework every single day. And the Knicks understand the, the, the pressure, really, that they have on themselves to make the right choice. This is an outstanding franchise. It's one of the best in the NBA, of course, in the world. So you have a city like New York that wants a winner. They, wants that, they want that marquee guy. And Scott Perry and also Steve Mills understand that they have to make sure that every single day they're doing their job to push the franchise forward. So if they fall into that third, fourth, or fifth spot, they'll be prepared for it. I believe that in terms of if you want to go with 
to R.J. Barrett at number three, depending on, you know, who lands those first two picks? Or if you're at that four or five spot, do you want to deal? Do you so want to talk to and, New Orleans? And this is where I counter our teammate, Alan Hahn, who thinks if it's not one or one through three, it's a trade. What if the free agent thing doesn't work out, God forbid, right? I think then you look at a team like Denver who's in the playoffs, or even if we want to go to Golden State in terms of an organization that did it through the draft. Yeah. Does it take a little longer? Is it more of a winding route? Probably. Seven, but, seven, eight, but, seven number one picks over the next five years. And the Knicks have done a good job the last couple of seasons molding the younger talent. Yep. And to me, good general managers – pick out a player in the draft that potentially isn't a top five, and then they make him into something good. I mean, that's really where you see the success in the draft. It's, like, not always going to be the number one pick. I mean, we saw some busts that we talked about earlier. It's, it's, there are a lot of number one busts. Next week, the NBA Draft Lottery. We're all waiting with bated breath for that. A few weeks ago, the NHL Draft Lottery, and the finish for the local teams was pretty exciting. The Rangers ended up with the number two overall pick, moving up from six, and at number one, the New Jersey Devils, once again, with a number one overall pick. And the prizes, they're pretty good. Jack Hughes, the American, one of the best players in the world right now in Capo Caco. The big Finn, who is already playing against grown Men. Well, the Rangers will have their pick at number two of either of these players. And GM Jeff Gordon is sitting down right now with our Bill Pito. Jeff, great to see you. Thanks for stopping by. Well, thanks for having me. So you're on a roll. This is our first MSG 150. Give us some of the Gordon karma. <laughs> We're going to have a great show. So, Jeff, you're there at the draft lottery. Yeah. Slowly but surely, it's going your way. Yeah. What's the emotion like? And then ultimately, you end up with second overall pick when they turn over the cards and then you know where your cards coming and it's not there um, I had my phone on vibrate thankfully on my back pocket all of a sudden as you know <laughs> <laughs> so was, we noticed yeah. some funny movements yeah. up there yeah, on the stage was, you're that getting was zapped nothing up. more than that I hope everybody knows that but uh, <laughs> I uh, it was a lot of that how many vibrating. texts did you get I had you know in the 200s of Texas of uh, people excited uh, of what just happened and uh, it was great. I, I, I hopefully on TV I wasn't, <laughs> but uh, no, it was great. I, I, and then you get to the, you know, you're going to three. So now, you know, like anything else, you want to get as high as you can, and and uh, and you hope for the best. So you're standing there, you know, the straightest face you can without smiling. And and when they flipped over three, and you're going two, you you, you, you know, I didn't want to jump up and down, but I felt like it. And are you and, conscious uh, of of your body and how you? Well, they tell you. I mean, I'm certainly no, you know, TV guy or anything. No, you're like becoming. You, Bill. You're becoming an uh, expert, Jeff. I but they do tell you, tell you to uh, to you know watch that and stare straight ahead. So I, you know, like now I'm trying to stare straight ahead. And and no, you're uh, supposed to be looking at me. Yeah. Well, you told me that. <laughs> you did tell me that. Um, but no, listen, it was great. And uh, to stand there, you know, froze, and it seemed it seemed like forever. It probably was just a few seconds, but. Uh, you know, when they flipped over and Chicago was going to go three and we knew we were in the top two, uh, you know, I was again, my phone was going, right? So it was good. It's a great night for the Rangers. It's a great, it's been a great experience to, to go over to these tournaments, uh, to watch these players and know uh, where we're picking. You know, in the past, they, uh, they had us not know. So you'd go to a tournament thinking, okay, I know we're probably picking, you know, six through ten or something. But now to know that we're picking two uh, to watch players, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a different kind of feeling and a good one. Two-player draft. The thought seems to be there are two transformative players. Are you glad to be at the number two position because it kind of leaves the one that's not picked potentially for the Rangers? Well, I'm glad to be in the top two. Uh, you know, whether we're number one or number two, we, we know uh, that there's a, a chance, an opportunity, a special player. So, uh, you know, we'll leave it at that. There's some still work to be done. There's some tournaments to play. and and uh, it'll all play itself out, but uh, we're certainly happy to, to have it come up our way for, for a change. Can you say capo caco? Uh, I can say capo caco. I can say anything if I write it down on a piece of paper. <laughs> right? You are ready to join the broadcast if that's yeah. who ends up yeah. uh, being with the capo Rangers. Capo caco. Yeah. Jack that, Hughes, I could say that's, that. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jack Hughes is easier than yeah. capo caco, but yeah. either way, yeah. what separates these guys in terms of their, everybody says their generational talents? It's the ability to make players better. Uh, when you step on the ice, uh, everybody's gunning for you. Everyone's doing everything they can to stop you, and they can't. Um, they they're both have that ability. Um, so, you know, they're different players, obviously. Um, but, 
they're both special in their own way. They, their years speak for themselves. So, uh, you know, I think it's great for the Rangers and, and uh, you know, the future's bright. It's been full speed ahead for you and the organization, even though the team is potentially going to hire a new president. What's that been for you to go through this now, making these decisions? Yeah, for me, it's really been no different, right? It, there's a lot of decisions to make every day, and, uh, you know, th that's that's the job, right? So, uh, you know, it, you know, we're making deals, we're trying to trade people, we're doing things that we can do, and, uh, you know, we made a deal the other day, so nothing really changes, nothing stops for, for the Rangers while they're out doing their search, so we're just, uh, you know, worried about tomorrow, what we're going to do. So you made the deal for Adam Fox, and we all know you did it because he's from Harvard. Yeah, yeah, Harvard, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. say that well. Another another guy yeah, from Massachusetts. Like from Boston, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, uh, I mean I, I think he's he's a terrific talent. He's a player that uh, that we've had our eyes on for a long time. Um, you know, when he was drafted, uh, you know, he slipped in the draft a little bit, and I think the game changes every day and and uh, moves in the direction of a player like this. Uh, his his puck poise, his, uh, his ability to make players better, like we talked about. He has all that, and uh, you know, I think uh, it, it should be exciting to see where he, where he fits in. Draft night, these are the key numbers to look at. Devils, number one overall pick again. Rangers at number two, moving up from six. Also have that Jets first round pick as well. And the Islanders have their first round pick coming up. They've had a great season as well. Bill, I got to tell you something. When Sorry, you my cell phone's. It keeps buzzing. It's like what happened with Gordon on draft night. I just draft lottery. Night. I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> That's actually a hysterical Isn't story. That amazing? Think about it. You know how many people just your phone blows up. They move up from six. I mean that kind of luck, and moving up to two for them, knowing what they're going through as well as rebuild, it advances the cause so much quicker that they can get a player like that. That if you think whoever it's going to be is plug and play, ready to play immediately. And it's interesting. I've talked to Jeff about this. At number two, you don't have to make the decision. That's a fair point. Devils have to make the decision. And also to keep in mind here, if Dallas wins this series against the Blues and makes it to the Western Conference Final, the Rangers will pick up a third number one draft pick. So they're watching that. And if Matt Zuccarello ends up signing with Dallas, they'll get another number one next year. So as many draft picks, Alan, as they have, it could even become a richer potential, depending on what happens with Dallas.